Sure, my name is Sandra Dorley and I'm the Monroe County District Attorney. Sure, so the Heroin Task Force was actually started somewhere around the summer, early fall of 2017, and it really took off when Sheriff Todd Baxter became sheriff in January of 2018. And that was really when we began to put teams together to go out to all of these overdoses, whether they be fatal or non-fatal, and gather the information. Before that, what I had done, I had learned that we really weren't collecting the data on overdoses. And I wanted to you know, figure out a way so that we could have real-time data so that we could identify who dealers were and perhaps start long-term investigations such as wiretaps. So I worked with other DA's offices around the state and I realized that some of them were using a form which would be simply something that law enforcement could fill out at the site of either a fatal or a non-fatal overdose and it would talk about who the, the overdose individual is or was. If the person had a phone, perhaps we could get into the phone and find out who the dealers were and begin our investigations and begin our cases that way. So we started collecting the data on these forms in the fall of 2017 and then we had the formal kickoff in around January, February of 2018 when the task force finally came to being in full force. You know, I think, it's, I think the task force is successful in that we're getting the message out. There's still people overdosing, there's still people dying, but the word is out there on the street that the heroin that people are buying is deadly and people are dying. And in terms of, you know, a law enforcement perspective, not only are we looking to arrest the dealers and put the dealers in prison, we're also looking to give you know, a second chance and treatment to those who are suffering from addiction. We, we don't want them to, to die because right now we're seeing so many deaths in our community. And we also know that we need to go out and, and capture um, you know, our, our young people and our people who aren't yet in, into drugs. We need to educate and really teach people about prevention because we don't want people starting to begin with. So the actual Heroin Task Force, um, there are many partners, myself, the Rochester Police Department, and the Monroe County Sheriff's Office, and many other of our local law enforcement agencies. The DA's office, for example, I've dedicated two full-time investigators to work with the task force. There's also members of Granite, which is the Greater Rochester Area Narcotics Enforcement Team. They're working on the task force as well. You know, the goal really is to identify all of the dealers out there and make sure that we could put together solid arrests and get them off the street. You know, we've got many tools here in Monroe County. In addition to the Monroe County Heroin Task Force, we also have our, our drug court. We have our opioid stabilization part. So we're attacking it from every single angle. You know, not only are we prosecuting, we're educating, and we're directing those who need help into the appropriate treatment. I think over the past year or so, we have seen a stabilization in the number of deaths caused by opioids. And I'm not sure if, if that's because the message is out there or if it's just reached a saturation point or if Narcan has anything to do with it. You know, every month we still look at the report, there's still people dying. So it means that, you know, people are trying to get the dope that's good. You know, they may want, they may want the stuff that just killed their friend because that's the higher high that they can get. But I think we're at the point now where we've stabilized. We're not seeing an increase or a spike in the deaths, but we still have a lot of work to go. You know, with regard to Narcan, um, all I know are anecdotal stories that you hear and it does seem that it's taking more and more um, shots of Narcan to revive an individual. And we've also heard anecdotally that, that dealers are giving away Narcan along with, with, with their dope. So it's out there, it's readily available, it is saving lives, yes, but maybe it's you know pushing people to the edge. Maybe they're taking more risks than they usually would have because of the of the availability of Narcan, and you know, 
if someday Narcan doesn't react to, you know, the strain of heroin that we have out there or fentanyl, I think we're, we're going to see a lot of deaths if we don't treat the cure, which is, you know, education and prevention. So when we talk about, you know, tools in the toolbox, there are many things that we're using to combat this epidemic. You know, like I said, we've started the Monroe County Heroin Task Force. We have our drug court. We have our opioid stabilization court. But there was another interesting um, program that was started in Staten Island that myself, the sheriff, and at that point the Rochester police chief went down and we looked at it. It's basically a post-arrest pre-arraignment diversion program. So if someone is arrested for a low-level drug offense, either you know a criminal possession of a controlled substance in the seventh degree, which could be cocaine or heroin, they could divert themselves out of the criminal justice system and go to a treatment facility. And if they meaningfully engaged um, in treatment, then the, ca the case would never ever make the inside of a courtroom and they would never be, and that would never show up on their record. So we went down and we thought, you know what, that would be a good complement in Monroe County to all of the other things that we're doing. And I'm happy to say that, you know, it took, it took a long time to, to get it moving, but we have started. We had our first case this past week and the person is agreeing to go into treatment and if that person stays in treatment for 37 days, that's the time period, then the case will never ever make it to the inside of a courtroom. And we just hope that the person continues, you know, their, the path to, to treatment. What's, what's causing the epidemic? I would say, you know, many, many things. Um, heroin, um, fentanyl in particular is very cheap. People have become addicted to, to pills and sometimes they can't sustain the cost of a pill addiction and they find that street heroin and street fentanyl is a lot cheaper. So in some ways, you know, our big pharmaceutical companies and our doctors are to blame. You know, but a lot of people, um, they, they, reach, they reach heroin from very different very different avenues. So I would say that there, there's no one path, but I would certainly say that an addiction to pills began with many people on the road to addiction. So again, you know, we're talking about the different things that, that we've been doing. And one of the things that Gary Mervis through Camp Good Days focused on was looking at, you know, our, our coaches and how they deal with pain and injury in student athletes. So he wanted to put a seminar together that would address potential addiction in student athletes. And he wanted me to be a part of it. And, you know, besides talking about the statistics that we see all the time, I wanted to do something different. So I went back to several of our, our cases where I knew from, from the case history that the defendant had started their criminality because of an opioid painkiller addiction and that they had been high school and or college athletes. So one of them had been out of custody, the other one is still in custody. So I went knocking on their doors to speak to them, to speak to their family, to see if they would come and speak to coaches. And through this, I met an individual by the name of Kyle Ruggieri. And Kyle has a wonderful story and he volunteered coming and speaking to me and speaking to coaches just a couple of Saturdays ago. And for him, it started with you know, suffering concussions. He was a football player. He had a full scholarship to college and he wasn't able to play because he kept having concussion after concussion. And in response, the trainer and the doctors kept giving him pill upon pill. And due to that, he became, he became a heroin addict. His story is tremendous. Kyle did serve some time in criminal in, in our state prison, but now he is out there. He wants to become a mentor. He's clean and sober, and you know I think the goal of his life now will be to help others, you know, stay on the right path and don't go down the same or make the same mistakes that he had. You know, as time goes, you know we've got to build up you know, the education component and the prevention component. We're pretty good now with our court system dealing with those who suffer from addiction 
you know, whether it be them actually coming to court, stabilizing in court, or perhaps being diverted through Project Hope. We have great law enforcement um, partners working on discovering who the, the, the big dealers are and working to get solid cases to get them off the streets. But education and prevention, you know, are the two keys that we need to really work on. You know, when we talk about how many overdoses occur per month, um, those are people who are surviving. Those are the people that we need to reach out to. Those are the people that, you know, we need to, you know, be there when they, when they are revived. And we need to say, you know what, would you like to, you know, come with us to open access clinic? You know, maybe law enforcement isn't the right person to do that, but if we've got peer mentors who can get the message across, I mean, that's, I think, an area that we really need to work on. Okay. You know, we also find that many people who are suffering from mental illnesses are also have a co-dependency issue with opioids. And what we are doing now, we meaning law enforcement, it's very similar to Project Hope, that if someone is arrested for a low-level offense and they're, you know, suffering from a mental illness, perhaps exacerbated by an opioid addiction, that we are going to bring them directly to treatment. Again, it's a way to keep people out of the criminal justice system and get them help from the get-go, get, get help from the start. We don't, we don't want to house people in our jails, particularly for, you know, for a mental illness. We want to make sure that people are in the right facility to get the right treatment. You know, we all need to be diligent in this effort. You know, one of the things that, you know, and I've spoken to senators before, you know, when a dealer knows that his dope is dirty and he goes out there and he sells and he could be selling it along with Narcan. And if that results in a death, that dealer you know, should be charged with some kind of homicide. Right now, there's not a strict liability for that. Sure, in the last you know year or so, We've been able to charge people with criminally negligent homicide or manslaughter in the second degree if they've caused a death, but it's not a strict liability crime like it should be. And perhaps if that were the case, then dealers, you know, wouldn't be so readily, you know, accessible and out there and willing and willing to sell a substance where they don't really know, you know, what they're selling. They may think that they're selling heroin when it's 99.9% .9 fentanyl. I think one of the things very frustrating is coming from the medical community where they are treating pain as the fifth vital sign. So if you go into your doctor for a checkup or for whatever, you know, not only will they take your temperature, your blood pressure, your heart rate, and so on, but they'll ask you, what is your pain level for today? And to me, that, you know, could be one of the causes for for this opioid crisis because it's very easy for someone to say, you know what, I'm at a 10 today. And then, you know, a doctor would say, well, can I give you something for that? The next thing you know, you're being prescribed Percocet, Vicodin, some kind of opioid. And the next thing you know, you could be addicted. You know, it's, it, I think the most important thing when we're, we're looking at this is to match the person up with the right kind of treatment, whether it be inpatient or outpatient. You know, a lot of people have said there is a shortage of outpatient beds, but I think this whole community should gather together and make sure that if a person says, I want to go into treatment now, that there is a facility for that person to go to now. You can't wait 12 hours, you can't wait 48 hours for a bed. When someone is ready, they're ready, or else, you know, you may not be able to get them to make that move if you have to wait. So it's so important for us to have accessibility to beds and or, you know, an outpatient treatment facility where we can get someone there 24-7. I think the needle exchange program, if it's done right, could be helpful. But... I, I keep getting back to, you know, we've, we've got to focus on the prevention and the education. I think that is the most important thing. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, I mean, look at, I mean, you've, you've picked up needles in North Clinton. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. After looking at the numbers, at least for the last year and a half, it looks like the numbers have stabilized. 
that's not to say that that we're going to see a slowdown, but at least we're not seeing an increase in the numbers. There's still a lot of work for us to do. For anyone out there, you know, who's suffering from addiction, you know, please, please get help. There is life after recovery. Recovery is possible. There's so many peer mentors out there who are willing to help. There's so many facilities, outpatient, inpatient. There's so many people who would be rooting for you. It is possible. Mother or father? No. I think the saddest thing is when we see parents in active addiction and what we see happen to their children, especially parents who have small children. And fortunately, you know, we've seen overdoses occurring in children, infants less than a year old, when parents or perhaps grandparents are very careless with their baggies. They leave them around. Little children like to put things in their mouths. We've seen several cases where little children, toddlers, you know, babies have ingested baggies and have had to be revived by Narcan. We had one case that we prosecuted where father was clearly a dealer and had left his well, two children home and left his fentanyl-laced heroin at home as well. And one of the, the children who had an addiction or a, a compulsion issue ate many, many of the bags and just died immediately. I mean, there was nothing left of his organs. I feel so sorry for the parents. I mean, there's, there's really nothing that I can say to them except be strong and don't let your child have died in vain, use that example and go out and educate and teach and perhaps, you know, prevent more deaths. For those of you who are out there and are selling, you know, heroin, fentanyl, and, and you're dealing this poison to the people on our, our streets, just know that we're coming for you and when we do, we won't have any mercy. Get involved. The way people in the community can get involved is to talk about it. For so long, no one talked about, you know, heroin addiction, opioid addiction, whether, you know, someone in your family was addicted to pills. People didn't talk about it. But now it has reached everywhere. It's reached all types of, of families. I'm sure everyone knows someone who has been affected by this, this epidemic. We need to talk about it and we need to erase the stigma, and we need to get people help. That's what we need to do. You know, one of the most important things, I mean, coming from the perspective, you know, of a prosecutor, of the district attorney, you know, I, I, I want to make it clear, for those who are suffering from addiction, we want, I want to be able to get you help. I want to be able to help you change your life because recovery is possible. But on the flip side, I have no tolerance for the dealers, for any of the dealers who are, you know, bringing this poison into our community and causing this addiction issue. So I guess it's a bright line. You know, if those who are suffering from addiction come to us and we will help you get help, recovery is possible. But dealers, you know, I like to see you all in prison. Um, <laughs> that was tough, yeah, but I don't care. I love it. Yeah, I don't yeah, care. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, I say that all the time. I mean, that's my, that's my stump I mean, speech. So, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah.